introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker may, really doesn't even need much of an introduction because Christopher Hawthorne has established such a reputation for himself as a leader, as the chief design officer for the city of Los Angeles, um, and particularly in the mayor's office. And prior to that, as an amazing writer uh, for the LA Times and authority on architecture. Um, I'm proud to say that Christopher and I worked closely together when I was in the mayor's office prior to my current position, and we share the same birthday. And so to my fellow Gemini uh, <laughs> partner in crime here, I'd like to welcome to the podium Christopher Hawthorne. Thank you so much, Sonia. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, we did work quite closely together in the mayor's office. I will never forget, um, just as a, a little anecdote about the power of mnemonic devices, my first day in the mayor's office, uh, Sonia step, stopped by my office to introduce herself and said, uh, my name's Sonia, Sonia like lasagna, not Sonia. I never forgot that. Um, so while other colleagues were calling her Sonia, I was thinking in the back of my mind, that's not how you pronounce her name. Um, and we do, we do share a birthday, June 20th. Um, so, r real pleasure to see you, Sonia, and I want to thank Marianne and everyone who's, I have to move out of the way of the plants to, to see you, um, and everyone else involved in organizing this fantastic event, uh, which in, this morning included many, uh, many of colleagues, uh, friends who I've worked with on these issues over the years. So I'm going to um, talk for half an hour or so um, about some of the work that we've been doing in the mayor's office, specifically related to the role that design and architecture can play in promoting a more productive, hopefully less polarized conversation about housing policy and the future of residential architecture across Los Angeles and Southern California. So. That's a way of saying uh, that my job is a little different from uh, those you've heard of, uh, heard from earlier today who, who spend all day, every day working on housing. Uh, my perspective is to really think about design and architecture and their role in promoting equitable and efficient outcomes across the city. And that has to do sometimes with housing, as you'll hear in the projects that I'll be talking about uh, this afternoon, but also includes public art and, um, and street furniture industrial design, a lot of other uh, subjects. Um, we've been working a lot with our native communities about acknowledging the buried histories and the way that public spaces are designed. We've been working a lot in rethinking how monuments and memorials are produced. Um, but as you'll see, a lot of the thinking and work we've been doing since I joined the mayor's office about three and a half years ago has really been centered on housing because housing housing affordability, homelessness, these are the most central and crucial issues of our time in Los Angeles, as is true in so many of other cities. So the talk I'm gonna to give today is really about the stories, and in particular one story that we tell ourselves about housing and domestic life in Los Angeles and the ways in which that story is limited, historically and otherwise, and limiting how it is both dominated our understanding of what Los Angeles means and how it will need, I think, to give way to new stories if we want to make the kind of progress that we've been hearing about this morning in battling our affordability and homelessness crises. Next. The dominant story, as you probably have guessed, is the idea that modern Los Angeles is a city not just dominated by single family housing, but a city where single family housing and the notions of progress and modernity are so closely intertwined as to be uh, nearly in indistinguishable or inextricable. This is Julia Shulman's famous photograph of Pierre Koenig's Stallhouse, better known as Case Study 22. This is perhaps the most uh, famous example of architectural photography to emerge from Los Angeles in the 20th century. Uh, the Case Study Houses, of course, as many of you will know, were part of Art, Art and Architecture magazine's famous program of producing new modernist housing pro prototypes for post-war Los Angeles, um, almost all of which, there were a couple of multifamily projects at the end of the program, but virtually all of them were single family houses, of course. Next. The artists of the period were very much caught up in this same dream. Um, it's amazing that this painting by David Hockney removes the human figure entirely uh, from the frame. There's a single figure in that first image by Julia Shulman, and here there is a record of a person having just been in 
in the frame and on that diving board. Um, but the house, and it's really its isolation from the rest of Los Angeles, um, is what's given pride of place. Although you can see, if you look carefully in the in those windows, you see a reflection of some other uh, some other nearby houses. Next. Every city has houses, of course. Every city has uh, that kind of relationship with single family architecture that I mentioned, but uh, nowhere has the connection between the architecture of the detached house and the ambitions of the city writ large been as close as has been the case in, in Los Angeles. This was true even for black architects like Paul R. Williams, who were prohibited by racially restrictive covenants from living in many of the neighborhoods where they had high profile commissions. So Paul Williams was working across Los Angeles for a number of celebrity uh, and other wealthy clients um, in neighborhoods where he was prohibited from buying uh, real estate and in some cases neighborhoods where he was prohibited from even spending the night uh, because of so-called sundown laws that uh, were in place in some parts of Los Angeles County at the time. And his response to those restrictions was to design a house for himself and his family shown here in Lafayette Square um, where those covenants did not apply. Next. That legacy of architects using their own houses to advertise certain complex ideas about freedom and constraint in Los Angeles continues to this day, of course, and continues other and includes other landmark examples like uh, Frank Gehry's own house in Santa Monica. Um, he bought an unassuming p uh, pink Dutch colonial uh, on a corner in low rise Santa Monica and wrapped it in chain link and plywood and corrugated siding beginning in the 70s and then remade it a, a second time in the 1990s. There's a famous story about that chain link that you can see at the top of the image on the upper levels of the house. Gary said he used to look down on a neighbor's tennis court uh, which was inside a chain link fence and thought, well, if I have to look at my neighbor's chain link, um, surely he won't line, mind looking at mine. The, the re reality was somewhat more complicated. Um, next. Um, the more important point is uh, that this idea of living at just enough of an arm's length uh, removed from your neighbors began to be inscribed across the whole landscape of, of urbanizing Southern California in the middle decades of the 20th century. This is Lakewood. Um, one of the first um, uh, subdivisions planned along those lines in Southern California for really, and I think it's important to say that this approach, um, this way of living, not just in the case study program, but also in, in, uh, in more populist visions like Lakewood, did really have um, a lot of appeal and for a really poetic exploration of the dignity that came with this kind of living, I recommend, well, whatever we make of its carbon footprint now, um, I recommend D.J. Waldy's book, Holy Land, which some of you may know, uh, which is about his experience growing up in one of these blocks in Lakewood. Uh, one of the best, best and most poetic books written about the built environment in, uh, in, in Southern California. Next. This inscription across the landscape is still quite easy to see in any zoning map of Los Angeles, of course. This one here is part of a recent New York Times series on the future of single family zoning across the United States and, and the magenta zones are single family making up roughly three quarters of the developable residential land in Los Angeles. Next. But lost in the dominance and I think the glamour to get back to Shulman and David Hockney of that story is an earlier story that complicates what would come later in all sorts of fascinating ways beginning really at the tail end of the 19th and particularly in the early years of the 20th century uh, with bung bungalow courts and garden apartments and extending to include proto-modernist experiments like the work of Irving Gill shown here. Los Angeles long before the case study program or long before Lakewood was emerging as a world leader really in multifamily housing that relied on a certain communitarian um, uh, ethos and provided a very high quality of life. And projects like this one, which is in the Ocean Park section of Santa Monica and bungalow courts across the city remain some of the most beloved, uh, most appreciated, most deeply appreciated housing in Los Angeles, but um, many of these projects would be illegal to build uh, today. Next. Not just Gill, but the modernist emigres Richard Neutra and R.M. Schindler, who collaborated in 1927 on this project, the Jardinette Apartments, uh, 
uh, were producing similarly appealing multifamily work in the decades before World War II. This photo is also by Julia Schulman, whose work we saw before. So be sure to note that foliage that's carefully positioned at the top left of the frame. Next. I mention it because this is one of Schulman's uh, favorite tricks to position leaves or even whole branches that way. Here's an example from uh, the shoot at the stall house, which I showed at the beginning of the slides. Note his assistant uh, here in the middle, whose job um, is literally to hold up a tree branch so it gets into the edge of the frame. This is one of my favorite photographs, the way that he's hanging, Schulman is hanging off that wall, sort of the way that the house uh, that we saw before hangs off the hillside. Next. Schindler was also working on his own to pursue the idea that multifamily architecture was entirely compatible with LA's sense of itself and its ambition in the years before mid-century. Next. And the other part of the story to keep in mind in terms of what would emerge as the post-war shape of this city is one that we've already hinted at when we saw the Paul Williams house, the systematic way, largely through lending restrictions that Los Angeles was actively segregated in terms of its housing options, its housing availability, ultimately its housing stock. And, and Sonia mentioned the obstacles to passing down wealth. And when we look at uh, gaps in household wealth between white and black households, for example, um, a significant amount of that, um, of, of that gap can be ascribed to the uh, ability of some households and the inability of others to buy uh, uh, residential architecture and quickly appreciating neighborhoods in the middle decades of the 20th century. Next. There also began to be a sense that Los Angeles was getting too crowded um, by the 1960s, an anxiety that paradoxically enough um, led to policy changes that actually did make the city more crowded and ultimately less affordable. So what do I mean by that? It, in short, a number of slow growth and some no growth movements, some spurred by the nascent environmental movement, in the 60s and into the 70s, other, others by concerns about traffic and congestion, the nuisance of construction, sprung up in Los Angeles. And as this chart, it's, which is many of you I'm sure have seen it before, it's, it's uh, famous among planners and, and some architects, comes from a dissertation at UCLA by Greg Morrow. It shows that taken together, the slow growth movements across the 70s and 80s, culminating in Prop U in 1986, had the effect of taking a city that had been zoned comfortably for a future population of about 10 million and uh, turning it into one zone by 1990 to accommodate, voila, just about precisely the number of people it already had. Next. The result was a dramatic decline in the amount of housing we built, particularly per capita, a decline that becomes most dramatic of all uh, in the 1990s, even as the city continued to add significant population. Next. And the result, predictably enough, uh, is a city that is deeply unaffordable uh, to most of its residents. Next. And while it's important to acknowledge, as, as I'm sure many of our earlier speakers uh, would continue to tell you, and, and many of you know well, that the causes of homelessness are hugely complex, there is a fundamental connection that I don't think we should lose between um, uh, constrained housing production, rising prices, and the number of people experiencing homelessness. Next. So where does that leave us? In terms of the work that I do as someone whose job is not only to promote good design, but to help expand an inclusive and, and hopefully broad civic conversation about architecture, residential architecture, and the future shape and identity of the city, it leaves us, I think, with an obligation to confront the ongoing legacy, both good and bad, of the centrality, as I mentioned, of the single family house um, sitting as it does uh, at the center of the very idea of what Los Angeles represents. It also means stressing the limits, of course, and the blind spots of that idea, and most important of all, stressing that it's an idea that's not eternal. We sometimes think of Los Angeles uh, as a city um, organized, designed, and built around the single family house as we think about it as a city organized, designed, and built around the car. And in fact, there's, um, there is a, a before to that idea and there is an after. So in the decades before World War II, um, we had the most extensive mass transit system in the country, if not the world, before we began to remake the city in the image of the car and automobility. 
Similarly, we had a remarkable collection, as I mentioned, of multifamily experimental housing um, um, at all income levels um, that was, um, I think, thrown into shadow when we remade the city in, around the image in, in, in the post-war decades of the single family house. Next. Some of the efforts in recent years, particularly the early ones, to write a different story were statewide efforts, as many of you know, like the housing bills SB 50 and SB 27, both sponsored by the, Cal the San Francisco State Senator Scott Weiner. And to put it mildly, they were not crafted specifically to address the story of LA's particular relationship with the single family house. Next. And these bills prompted suspicion and opposition not just from homeowners in wealthier parts of the city, but also from communities of color throughout uh, much of the Los Angeles basin who have good reason after redlining and urban renewal and highway expansion and other examples of ambitious top-down state and federal planning to be highly wary of blanket or totalizing zoning solutions. And so what was needed as I began to think about these issues in my new position at City Hall was an effort to address these issues in and for Los Angeles specifically and to encourage a conversation about how we could move past the rigidity of the single family paradigm without, uh, without going back to the arrogance of those earlier methods. Next. <clears throat> This was, in essence, the genesis of the low, rising, the low rise housing challenge, pardon me, which we launched last year. Uh, this was a, uh, a housing design challenge uh, in four categories, and the goal was to imagine new housing models for single family and low rise multifamily neighborhoods across the city in the range of four to 10 units that could help us clearly picture some of the benefits in terms of community cohesion, the ability to age in place, walkability and affordability, not, not last, not least, um, that well-designed multifamily architecture can bring to communities across the city. So from the start, we wanted it to be different from, and in fact, to include a really fundamental rethinking of how architecture and design competitions sometimes work uh, and for whom they are organized. Um, and I say this as someone who is organized a few, who has sat on a number of juries, who has seen how they work. And sometimes design competitions can feature a really unfortunate dynamic in which architects from elsewhere, whether that elsewhere is cities nearby or somewhere else in the, in the country or around the world, impose their visions of future design or architecture on neighborhoods and communities from outside, from without. And we really worked to flip that idea upside down in terms of how we organized um, this initiative. We began with extensive community engagement listening sessions in which tenants and homeowners, affordable housing developers, other community leaders, discussed the ways in which they would like to see their own neighborhoods evolve, both in terms of what might be added that those neighborhoods were missing and are missing and also in terms of what they wanted to protect and preserve and what they valued most. And we made these listening sessions, which made up almost eight hours altogether, required viewing for anyone entering the Low Rise Design Challenge, and we um, adapted or shaped the scoring criteria to reflect the importance of listening, first and foremost, to uh, those comments from the communities um, that stand to be affected by any change in zoning or land use that we make in Los Angeles. Next. We brought together a really remarkable and diverse jury. I won't expect you to read all these names, but um, it was diverse in background, diverse in expertise, seven jur jurors in each of the four categories to make up 28 altogether. They included residential architects, also affordable housing experts, planners, uh, yes, tenants, as I mentioned, leaders of community land trust, folks that are not often invited to be part of juries for design competitions. Um, you'll see some of the names of folks that you heard from earlier, including Matt and Stephanie. Um, and the conversations we had in those jury uh, sessions were indeed really different and wider ranging and, and found different moments of, of, um, uh, of, pr of productivity and tension than any other I had ever been a part of. And as I mentioned, I've been on, I've been on a few. Next. 
We ended up receiving uh, from around the world, but primarily we had a majority of our entries from Southern California. We ended up getting more than 375 entries, which was a really staggering number, especially given that we asked all of those entries to spend uh, so many hours watching those listening sessions and really thinking about what the communities were telling them about what kinds of architectural and design solutions would make sense for existing communities who have concerns about what any kind of change to land use, zoning, density will mean in their neighborhoods, even if um, in, in a more abstract sense, many of them uh, support the idea of moving in the direction of new, uh, of, a, of a greater list of, of housing options in their own neighborhoods. Next. And the ones that rose to the top really paint a picture of, I think, of a city where new multifamily housing models both seem organic to Los Angeles and its design and cultural history in some of the ways we've been talking about, and also promise to bring new benefits to communities, um, not just in terms of affordability, but also flexibility, and I'll talk a little bit more about that idea in a second. Next. In fact, I, I think once COVID hit and we all had a lot of time to analyze our own residential settings, right? Our own uh, houses, communities, apartments. Um, I think many of us looked at, at designs that won in the competition like this one, which is by an architect uh, named Von Weisenberger. It was the first place um, in the corners category, which asked architects to, to produce seven to 10 units across two connected lots at the corner. Um, and I think many of us saw the very picture of how we wanted to be able to live during the pandemic, which is to say, thinking about um, uh, well-designed shaded outdoor spaces that give way to private spaces that are suitable for working from home or, or even quarantining if necessary for separating oneself from the community without giving up the benefits of living in that kind of connected um, uh, community. And what we saw in the fatalities and the victims of COVID in Los Angeles is that they were largely in multi-generational and overcrowded housing. We have some of the most overcrowded housing in the country in Los Angeles. There are a lot of ways in which multi-generational uh, housing appeals to and is central to the way that many communities would like to live in Los Angeles, but our housing stock is sometimes too rigid to meet uh, the flexibility required to live that way. And so a lot of the winning designs really did help paint a picture uh, of designs that would strike that balance a little bit better than our, than our typical um, uh, zoning and, and housing stock does. Next. This is the first place winner in another category by an LA firm called Am Givening, working with a landscape firm, a Studio MLA, the Allaire's office, imagining four units arranged uh, really thoughtfully for a balance of public and private space, private and shared space, but also imagines giving back some of the, uh, the front lawn, uh, where a lawn used to be, to a community easement that actually over time would create a shaded greenway along the sidewalk, connecting one street to the next. Next. The coverage that the winners of this design challenge received both locally and nationally did, I think, help uh, begin to change the conversation and lower the temperature a bit on debates about the future of housing in Los Angeles, um, suggesting ways in which new green alleys lined by duplexes is shown here in another winning entry in one of the low-rise categories by the LA architect Louisa Van Leer might bring both environmental and social benefits to communities like Garvanza, Northeast LA, Highland Park, which is where this entry is located. Next. Meanwhile, we were pursuing another program that I'll mention briefly that had similar goals, um, which is to say showing alternatives to the single family paradigm as giving tenants and homeowners alike, I think, some new reasons for optimism and flexibility in how and where they live. In this case, we worked with the LA Department of Building and Safety to develop uh, a program that we call the Accessory Dwelling Unit Standard Plan Program, essentially a kind of design pre-approval process in many cities around the state are pursuing something similar that allows homeowners to choose from a list now, which is uh, about two dozen designs strong, of designs for ADUs that have been pre-vetted by the department, by LADBS, for a smoother, faster, and less expensive approvals process. Up next. And the designs really range from sums with, with a kind of a vernacular uh, references. Next. To more streamlined and uh, modular designs. Quite a few of the designs in the program are prefabricated or modular. 
ADUs across the city have been really one of our housing success stories and they're certainly not a silver bullet by any means. They will not solve the housing crisis on their own, but they are worth supporting and streamlining in every way possible. And I think we have seen as the volume of ADUs has grown across the city, particularly in places like the San Fernando Valley, we have not seen the kind of backlash uh, against them that, that was predicted um, when some of the AU, ADU uh, programs were put in place at the state level. Next. And this ADU standard plan program remains the only program I've worked on to be covered both by uh, the HUD Journal in Washington, D.C., uh, a wonky policy publication if there ever were one, and uh, House Beautiful uh, on the right. Next. This year, as you all know, and I'm sure you've discussed already, Sacramento did finally pass legislation opening up single family uh, neighborhoods to denser housing types, but significantly, and I think as a result of the way in which this conversation has changed at a much more modest scale than the earlier versions we talked about, like, like SB 27 and SB 50, Senate Bill 9, which will take effect January 1st of next year, will allow single family lots to be split and a new duplex placed on each, essentially allowing the potential for fourplexes in single family neighborhoods. Next. It's a policy shift that we very much anticipated and wanted to start a conversation about in low rise and specifically a category called subdivision that was won by the Louisa Van Leer Alley proposal that I showed earlier. And to the extent that there is more acceptance, at least cautious acceptance of this approach, uh, we hope that the, that the low rise discussions helped contribute to something of a, um, a more sanguine or calmer conversation. A recent LA Times poll, which may, some of you may have seen yesterday, uh, showed that in the city of Los Angeles, fully 60% of voters support uh, the changes made possible by SB9 and even, I think, more significant that homeowners in the city favor SB9, at least according to this poll, uh, more of them uh, 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 favor than oppose it, which I think is a really remarkable finding. Um, and the city, as you know, I'm sure is in the, in the midst of putting together an implementation plan for SB9, and it really remains to be seen. There are a lot of different uh, predictions about the volume of new housing and new construction that it will produce. Um, some studies, like one from the Turner Center, UC Berkeley, have suggested that that volume is likely to be relatively modest, um, but we shall see. Um, so what are the key lessons that I've learned doing these two projects and then broader work next? A couple that I just want to leave you with. Um, the first is that I think we found in our community listing sessions and the other outreach that we did in putting Low Rise together and working with communities, architects, uh, homeowners on the ADU standard plan program and other initiatives is that I think the polarization of the NIMBY, YIMBY divide that is for not in my backyard on one side and yes in my backyard on the other is often overstated and that what we find is that most Angelinos that we've talked to are somewhere in between. They realize that the land use and zoning policies that we have relied on um, uh, in Los Angeles for much of the 20th century, as I've discussed, are not sustainable for the 21st century, both in terms of equity, reckoning with these histories of exclusion and the impacts that those histories have on present day gaps in, uh, in household wealth, for example, and in terms of climate change and environmental concerns and the need to locate housing much more strategically and intelligently close to housing, uh, to close to jobs uh, a a and transit. Um, at the same time, even where there is support for these uh, kinds of modest uh, changes, there is concern about what um, uh, new policy like SB9 will mean in folks' own communities and their own neighborhoods and that, it, that concern is particularly acute and for good reason, and all the reasons that I've mentioned already in communities of color. Um, and so um, that, I think the, the way that we talk about SB9, the, the way that we craft initiatives like Low Rise has to meet people where they are, which is to say to address those concerns and realize how, how, legitimate, uh, how legitimate they are. Um, I think the incremental steps that began with ADUs and are now about to take another step forward in terms of SB9 are important while keeping these larger systemic goals in mind, both in terms of equity and in terms of climate. Second, that, that the, given the zoning map and the patterns of settlement in Los Angeles, that uh, concentrating at this low rise scale, um, uh, but really thinking about large scale zoning footprint is really where we need to be moving the next conversations. Yeah, next. 
And then in terms of specifically the work that I do, um, thinking about the role that design plays, that the power of good design and effective architecture is, is fundamentally to help bridge these these gaps and help communities imagine the benefits that new housing options can bring. And I mentioned flexibility before. I think one of the difficult um, aspects of single family zoning is its rigidity and the way in which different um, life experiences, the way that we move through different housing needs as we move through our lives. All of us, I think, have moved through small apartments to larger apartments. Some of us become homeowners, then want to live uh, perhaps in smaller, um, uh, kinds of housing options as we get older, if we want to age in place. The rigidity of a lot of the ways that we have organized a housing paradigm in Los Angeles does not lend itself to the kind of flexibility which would allow us to move through those different stages of life while maintaining the kind of ties to community uh, and community cohesion that I think are important to so many um, Angelinos. So, that, you know, that multi-generational households, the, the possibility of, uh, of aging in place, the possibility on the other side of the generational spectrum of, uh, of young people who have grown up in neighborhoods in Los Angeles who want to return and live in those same communities and the difficulty of getting a foothold and buying into those neighborhoods where they grew up um, is significantly is important as well. Um, and then this kind of distancing privacy within a larger kind of cohesive community um, is something that we heard consistently uh, that um, that folks want to see more of in the housing that they have available that, that they have available to them, um, and let me talk in closing about the last two walkable neighborhoods and and local retail, which really go hand in hand. I think again during the pandemic, a lot of us realized what our walk sheds look like, uh, the number of amenities that we are able to walk to, and in some cases in Los Angeles, the limitations, how little is available to us within that walk shed, um, and a, an example of how. What we heard in the community listening sessions, what the architects helped us explore in low rise and what we're pursuing on a policy, from a policy point of view, is corner stores and local retail that can be walked to. So we heard consistently across every conversation that we had in putting together low rise that people love the idea of reintroducing corner stores into their low rise residential neighborhoods. That was a consistent consensus across uh, conversations in all parts of the city. And in fact, in some of our updated community plans, Boyle Heights is a good example. We're exploring that very idea. Um, and I think the uh, thinking about the, the residential density that can support walkable local retail, support small businesses, um, will require a recalibration, if only a modest one, in, how, in, in terms of how we think about zoning and, uh, and the housing types that are, um, that are available to us. So these conversations remain difficult, they remain complicated. Um, the particular uh, feelings that people have about their residential communities, their own house or apartment or neighborhood, um, make these conversations fundamentally different in character and kind than any other kinds of policy discussions we have with the possible exception of, of driving and traffic and mobility in Los Angeles. And I think what that means is that we need to, we need to tailor our initiatives, things like the design competitions that I've mentioned, um, to meet people where they are, to uh, address their legitimate concerns about both the history of their own neighborhoods and what they would like to protect in those neighborhoods, while also acknowledging the need to really uh, open up some new paradigms for housing across the, uh, across the 21st century. So next, I really uh, have appreciated the chance to share some of this work with you. I, I encourage you to be in touch with me uh, directly if you have any thoughts or questions and, and, and thank you for your attention this afternoon. And I think we have a little time for questions. Yeah. Um, Hi. I like what you said about the corner stores and stuff, but looking at the um, design competitions, I don't see any like mixed use or, you know, I mean the kind of stuff that a small European town would have, mm. you know, people living above stores. What's the reason why that wasn't picked? Why so, wasn't shown? so did everybody hear the question as why there wasn't more mixed use um, uh, housing over, over stores or retail uh, commercial spaces in the competition? We were looking specifically in low rise at residential neighborhoods that were zoned uh, single family or multifamily. So there are a lot of neighborhoods where that kind of mixed use is possible. 
Um, but, and we did want to open up the conversation in that direction. So we actually required in the corners category that I mentioned, which is we asked uh, design teams to propose seven to 10 units, as I said, across two, assuming that two lots could be combined. Um, and we, we did require that there be a retail or community space um, as part of those proposals. So we were very much hoping to uh, open up the conversation in that direction. But most neighborhoods, it's, just, it's uh, frankly impossible um, to do any of that. But I see a lot of strip malls. And if we could rezone some of the strip malls, you could just build on top of those and you could probably get less resistance than you get in residential. Right, so I think we've seen a lot of strip malls be redeveloped on our major commercial corridors and turned into housing. In fact, that's um, mainly where we have produced most of our multifamily is on those uh, major transit corridors. We've had essentially a kind of grand bargain in Los Angeles that we will uh, protect uh, the, the zoning at the low rise level in exchange for putting uh, more intense new housing production along those corridors. And I think we've seen some positive results from that policy, the TOC, Transit Oriented Communities Program, in particular in terms of it, uh, producing new affordable units has been another success story on the other end of the spectrum in terms of scale from ADUs. Uh, but that leaves um, uh, unexplored this massive territory in between. And I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that if we don't address in a thoughtful way that in-between territory, with, which after all makes up such a significant proportion of our developable residential land in Los Angeles that we're not gonna make the kind of headway on our climate and our affordability goals that I think we've been talking about um, throughout the program. My question is on the zoning. Has the zoning become easier, especially for those residential areas, <laughs> predominantly residential at the time? Tell me a little bit more about what you mean. What I'm thinking of is there are some locations in South Central Los Angeles that were primarily residential, and they had large lots attached to them. The zoning of that, did it have to change? Some of it did change over time, and some of those neighborhoods um, it, it are, now are now zoned for smaller scale multifamily, and we've seen the, mo the most intensity of, uh, of the production of housing at the scale that I've been talking about in many of those neighborhoods. Um, and I think there has been an equity conversation about uh, why those neighborhoods are, are seeing the most intense housing production as opposed to a more uh, evenly distributed attempt to build housing in neighborhoods across the city. Um, and I think, you know, when we talked to folks in South Los Angeles as part of the engagement that we did, we. We heard a lot of concerns about what the impacts of that construction uh, look like uh, on blocks where, where the, the participants in those conversations live, and we tried to incorporate that feedback into the way that we shaped the design brief for the, for the low-rise competition. Thank you. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit more about SB9? Uh, the jurisdictions I've spoken with were very much against it and are still very fearful of it, thinking it's gonna create a lot of chaos. Do you think they, there's a way that they can kind of get ahead of the curve by pre-approving designs or, or something? Thank you for that question. Yes, I think um, cities around the state are now putting together their so-called implementation memos on how SB9 uh, will be um, administered in their communities and you, some of you may have seen a piece this week by Liam Dillon in the, in the LA Times about how the different approaches that some cities are taking. Um, some really trying to make it difficult uh, for that new housing to be built. The conversation that we're having is really very much along the lines that you're talking about. How we can get ahead of the curve in thinking about how to promote um, uh, designs taking advantage of SB9 that will actually bring some of these communities benefits to communities and learn some of the lessons that we learned during the low-rise project. And that's specifically why we had that subdivision category, because um, uh, earlier versions of what became SB9 had been going through the process in Sacramento, and it wasn't until SB9 came along. And, and some uh, amendments were made, particularly about uh, residency requirements and other things, uh, and some protection for, hills, uh, for uh, fire, high, high fire risk neighborhoods, which would exempt certain uh, um, parts of cities from SB9 that um, that, it, that it became law that it really that it really was able to attract a majority in in the legislature in, in Sacramento. 
So for us, that means really thinking about maybe extending the, um, the pre-approved standard plans or doing some version of standard plan that would apply to SB9 projects. There are a number of cities that we're hearing from around California that are pursuing something similar. Um, and then thinking about what design standards we might put in place. Um, and the design standard question is particularly difficult and tricky because there is a, a requirement, thanks to SB 330, which um, prohibits um, a, a subjective design standards from keeping any housing from being produced. And that means we have to uh, try to produce so-called objective design standards. And there is still a way of doing that while promoting good design. Um, but it means that we have to follow the, the SB 30 uh, guidelines as we think about crafting a response to, um, to SB 9. So they, these are precisely the conversations we're having with colleagues at the city planning department right now in Los Angeles, and I know that other cities are having around the country. And one of the steps that we'll be taking is to bring together some architects bef between now and January. We've already begun to have these conversations to, ha um, to have them help us think through what the implications are just from an architecture and design point of view. There are concerns, um, one thing that was mentioned in the Liam Dillon piece in the LA Times is that Pasadena is actually um, considering a requirement that uh, about protecting tree canopy so that for every tree removed that, that a, a shade tree would have to be replaced, uh, would have to be planted to replace it. And that does track with a concern that we heard a lot of during the community engagement for low rise, that even in neighborhoods, even when we spoke to the Sustainability Alliance, Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance, which supports, uh, which represents uh, folks working on sustainability in neighborhood councils across Los Angeles, uh, who are very supportive of many of these proposed changes, we heard a consistent concern about losing tree canopy and shade cover, particularly in warmer uh, parts of the city. And that's a real concern in particularly in neighborhoods where a majority of the tree cover, the canopy, and the cooling that comes with it is on private property rather than in the public right of way. I think we all know that there are a lot of neighborhoods in LA where that's the case. And so we do want to try to pay careful attention. I don't know that we'll follow Pasadena's lead necessarily in terms of that requirement, but we're very mindful of ways in which we might promote um, the protection of that tree canopy and architectural solutions that can live within and among existing trees or uh, I'll replant that kind of shade cover where necessary. So these are specifically the questions that we're sort of hashing out now, and they, they exist within this ecosystem of other restrictions that, uh, and other guidelines that shape uh, housing policy across the state. Great, well, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. This is um, the first public talk that I've given in person since the pandemic, so it's really nice to be out from behind the Zoom camera and actually see some people, including some familiar faces in person. So thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much, Christopher. It's so great to hear from you and just kind of a different perspective and good things that are happening in the city of LA with um, planning and so on. So um, I want to point out that in your packet, there is a sheet front and back that says action list. And throughout the day, different speakers have mentioned if you want to get involved and they've had some of their own ideas but our committee our planning committee actually put together a list as well so there's a range of different things some are more involved than others um, could be everything as, as Sonia mentioned you can go onto the uh, Valley Economic Alliance website and say I support housing um, it can be putting together toiletry kits for the unhoused if you have a scout troop or church group or group of employees that want to do that if you want to be involved in other ways over the holidays, there's a number of different things that you could do. So we encourage you to look that over and take some action as you move forward from here. I want to thank again our um, speakers and so on. I do want to mention, we, we missed Latina Jackson today, and I, I just want to mention she did send a text and said that her father had, I think, a stroke this morning and had to be put into hospice care. So she obviously needed to be with her family. So um, she extended her deepest apologies, and, and we want to accept that. But I do want to thank our other speakers today, um, starting with Carrie Morrison, Wendy Gruel, Ken Kraft, Stephanie Klasky gamer Helmi Hisrich, Matt Glesney, Al Grizioli, and B. Stotzer. So all of them were really wonderful and shared a lot of great experience and information with us. Um, I want to say a special thanks to our um, conference planning committee, our hardworking Community Foundation Board of Directors, and of course our partners, the Valley Economic Alliance. Um, 
I, just another plug again for our January 12th event, Community Foundation event, Giving Techniques That Maximize Charitable Benefits. And then our sponsors, we're so grateful to all of them for their generous financial support. Wine, Weingart Foundation, Wells Fargo, Baker Tilly, Many Mansions, Pierce College, South and Real, Real South and Real Regional Association of Realtors, Hollywood Community Housing Corporation, San Fernando Community Mental Health Center, Santa Clarita Economic Development Corporation, SoCal Gas, UCLA Health, and Mel Wilson and Associates. So thanks to all of them. I know many of them are represented today. If you have not already done so, please be sure to fill out your evaluation surveys. Uh, Peggy's moving around and wants to make sure to collect those. And um, now, if you, if you have time, want to stay and chit-chat a little bit, I think there's still some refreshments over there, some drinks and so on. So love for you to stay around. And otherwise, I think we are adjourned. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today.